was able to go into my qualifiers and do what I wanted to do and, you know, get a decent start in the main, and that's what's happened. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I don't know what the other guys are doing. I'm trying to, you know, be like Damon Bradshaw and do what I want to do this year. And, and, you know, I've got high expectations of myself, and I've been working hard, and it's paying off for me. Can you keep up this kind of pace for the whole championship series? Are you concerned about burning out or hurting yourself worse than you already have? No, I don't think so. I think after I get over this injury, I can go back to being Damon Bradshaw again and, you know, possibly win some more races this year. That's what I want to do. Well, Dave, while we have Damon with us, why don't we take a look at the layout here in uh, Seattle Kingdom, the track we build on the floor, and uh, then we'll put him on the seat of the Scott bike cam and go for a ride around the track. Well, they've hauled 500 truckloads of dirt into the Kingdom to build a racetrack. On paper, this is what it looks like. It's a whole lot more impressive if you see it from the seat of the bike. Damon, how about taking us for a tour? Going down the start, start straight here, you have a breaking bump before these doubles. About this time, you're wondering off the start who's going to jump these doubles and who's not, so you're not landing on anyone. And right after this, you have a series of whoopie doos into a left hand ball turn. Kind of tricky because the last one's a kicker, and you have to be set up for these. And really, it's really important here to choose the right rut to make these triples really smooth because you don't want to land up short. And you have a short double into this corner. You kind of want to stay inside here because it's a little faster instead of going out high. And you jump right into these other ones. This here is the toughest part of the track because these are offset. They throw you off balance. And you kind of run a different line every lap. You don't do the same thing every lap. And into a right hand and then into a step up jump here. It's hard to do this every lap because there's not a very good lift on that jump. And coming up to the finish line right here. Longer tabletop than usual. And we have a couple moguls coming into this next right hand corner. Do a number of things here. You can go inside, roll one, then do two, two to the end. Or you can go to the outside and do two, two, then one. And a right hand into this tunnel. That's one lap of the Seattle team going. Damon, you do that 20 times tonight, and uh, you'll have win number three in the bag if you do it just right. Don't fall off that thing again tonight, okay? <laughs> Damon, we want to thank you very much for uh, joining us up here and wish you the best of luck out here this evening. Uh, thank you. I'll just see if I can stay on two wheels tonight and do my best. You stick with us, and we'll find out if Damon does indeed put it all together here in the Seattle Kingdom. We'll be back right after this. Hello everyone, I'm Larry Myers. Welcome back to Camel Supercross. With me, Dave Despain. We're in the Kingdome in Seattle, Washington. Outside, the weather is blowing. There's about six inches of snow on the ground. In fact, qualifying became a problem because of the weather. Had to make some changes, Larry. The fans from Seattle were able to get here, but there are Supercross motorcycles strung all the way up and down this coast, clear to San Diego. The snowstorm simply kept a lot of guys from getting here. As a result, a little change in the program tonight. There will be two heats rather than three. We'll move up the top six from each rather than five. The semifinals will run as scheduled, but we'll advance three riders from each of those, and we'll take two out of the last chance qualifier. We'll still end up with 20 in the main, but the way we get there will be a little different. Okay, we know the game plan. Now let's take a look at some qualifying action. And we're going to start with heat race number one, familiar face. Number 20 is Jeff Matasevic. He's had a great series thus far. 17 is the hometown favorite, Larry Ward. And behind him, Coxie's Army, all looking for a place in the main. And in between them, the French world champion, Jean-Michel Bale, number 22, aboard the uh, Honda motorcycle. Now, as we said, the top six riders will go into the main event. However, a rider cannot set back in the heat race and take that number six position. He simply can't afford that. He needs to finish further up because the better a rider finishes, the better his pick, or the earlier his pick on the starting gate for the main event. Now Larry Ward, number 17, Snohomish, Washington, is home to this youngster, has moved ahead of uh, Jean-Michel Bale on the Honda, and Ward is looking to catch Batasevich. He for his competition, but Ward is not waiting around. Look at this. Ward goes to the inside, and Dave, we're looking at a pass there that uh, I guess if you're a Kawasaki fan, you're going to holler foul, but a Suzuki fan is going to say that was great. Let's look at it one more time. As Ward comes into the corner, he's got the block pass in mind, takes Potasevich up high. The idea is to end up in front of the guy when you hit the apex and make the turn and head back the other direction. Ward did exactly that. No contact, very close as to whether or not that was a clean pass. Well, I'd have to side with the Suzuki riders on that one, with the Suzuki fan. Look like an excellent pass. Here comes Batasevich right back. Heat race number one. That's the competition we're looking at. And again, Ward kind of holds his line. Takes it all the way up to the bail. And, and any chance that Batasevich may have had to go around the outside uh, was just shut off. Uh, effectively, Ward is doing a job. 
But what he's trying to do is use up both lines on the racetrack by dodging to the inside. He sends Matasovic high because Matasovic doesn't want to follow him. And then when he goes up and makes that blocking move, the idea is to blunt Matasovic's momentum. It's a legitimate move. The guys do it all the time, and it's become much more prominent here. And I see Matasovic goes up high when he comes back. Ward is on his line. It's become very prominent in these uh, two-line high bank Supercross turns. Well, to date in the Supercross series, we've had a running battle between the rookies and the veterans. Uh, what we're looking at right now, folks, two rookies. Uh, Larry Ward out in front, number 17 from Snohomish, Washington. The Hopper Heights, California, is home as he does it one more time. Now, that time, Dave, he looked back. He looked to see where Jeff Matasevich was, then deliberately took him up to the wall. Now, I, I don't know. I would think that, that Ward would be more concerned with riding his own race and trying to pull away as he takes the checkered flag. But uh, he was putting on a, a defensive battle there. Uh, no matter, he got the job done. Ward wins it over Matasevich, who I'm sure is a little unhappy about all that blocking. Uh, Bale was third. The French world champion Tishner and Johnson round out the top five. And the youngsters make their presence felt in heat race number one. Heat race number two, there's Jeff Stanton, the defending champion. Right behind him, Jeff Ward, two times the Supercross champ. So the veterans are coming back in the second and final heat race and making their presence felt. It's Stanton out front, followed by Jeff Ward. Let's put this business of Jeff Stanton being a veteran into perspective. Certainly, you have to call the series champion that. But keep in mind that up until last year, about this time, this kid had never won a Supercross race. He's only 21 years old. He definitely inherited the top spot in Team Honda when Ricky Johnson got hurt. Made the best of it, won the championship. Ward, on the other hand, number three, has been around, seems like forever, started racing when he was four. Good point. Uh, he has been around for a long time, but he still rides effectively. As a matter of fact, Ward has been throughout the series to date. One of the fastest, if not the single fastest rider on the track. But he has been plagued with problems and bad luck, most of which, I might add, have not been his doing. Meanwhile, Jeff Stanton is starting now to leave the rest of the field in heat race number two. Ford has dropped back about uh, five, six bike lengths aboard that lime green Kawasaki. It's Mike Kidrowski, number 11 aboard a Honda, in third place. Mike LaRocco from Team Suzuki has moved to the number four position. Heat race number two winding down. Ward's keeping some pressure on Stanton here as they work through the whoop de doos It looks like Kadrowski and uh, LaRocco may be closing it up a little bit. A little bobble right there by Stanton. Keep in mind that Jeff won the last series race and said going into this series he was going to take the first two or three races pretty conservatively, let things sort themselves out. I don't think he was prepared for Damon Bradshaw and the two opening uh, round victories, but I think Stanton's right where he wants to be in terms of defending his championship. We come back to that question, rookies and veterans. Now we're seeing an example now of how the veterans would play it. Uh, Jeff Ward is uh, following uh, Jeff Stanton and he's content to pick over the lines. He's watching where Stanton is going and if the opportunity presents itself then he'll try to make a pass. Now the rookies I promise you would not wait. They would have the wheel in sideways. They'd have it upside down. They'd have it underneath anywhere they could stick it. And as a matter of fact here comes Mike LaRocco. He's not waiting for anyone. Let's give a call, too, to Damon Bradshaw. Number eight being lapped here with the hurt foot, slid down early, uh, but without further injury. Here is the checkered flag for number one, Jeff Stanton. Good finish for Mike Morocco. Morocco coming out hard the last couple of laps, finishing in the number two position. Jeff Ward finishing in third. He just wasn't awake on that last lap. For entertainment that's always a hit, catch cinema. Welcome back. This is the Camel Supercross Series. We're in the Seattle Kingdom. I'm Larry Myers. With me, Dave Despain. This is semi-final qualifying action. Mike Fisher, uh, number 23, aboard the Kawasaki from Sandy, California, is headed for the checkered flag, and he'll go into that main event along with two others from the semifinal. Alan Dick and Fred Andrews will take those other two spots. Brian McGarry and Dag Boyison are headed for the uh, for the last chance qualifier. And that was a runaway as we move into semifinal number two. You're going to see another one. This guy, Damon Bradshaw, showing off a little bit. He just slid down in the heat race, and that's what forced him into the semis. But once he got in here, Larry, he really put on the show. Well, our question, of course, was, is Damon Bradshaw going to be healthy for the Seattle King Dome race? One week ago, hurt himself, hurt his foot severely while riding in San Diego, crashed uh, all by himself off the top of this monstrous jump had not had the opportunity to practice so his timing had to be off but uh, he's putting out quite a show here for the fans and looks healthy to me 
Dane Matson and Kerry Mulligan get the other two transfer spots out of the semifinal. Dowd and Young will have to ride the LCQ. LCQ sounds like something from a short order truck. Last chance qualifier coming your way. John Dowd, a Florida rider out in front. He's followed by Chris Young aboard the yellow Suzuki. Behind them, Jason Upshaw, number 53 on that Honda. It's all jammed out at this point. Top two riders will go to the main. Normally just one, but because of the abbreviated uh, qualifying sessions this evening due to bad weather, top two riders from the last chance qualifier will make it into that main event. And the bad weather is a break for some of these kids, Larry. It'll move them a little closer to the front than they might otherwise have been. 53 is Jason Upshaw. He has run well in the previous series. Oh, down the leader is in trouble. He's down. He is down quickly back up. Let's take another look at that and see if we can spot the problem. Well, he's got an awful lot of lift on the rear end there, Larry. It came up and hit him in the rear end and uh, basically lost the front end, went on his nose. He didn't hurt himself. He's back up quickly. And as a matter of fact, he's back out there chasing these guys down. I think that's no is uh, being spanked. Our new leader, number 102, Chris Young on the Suzuki. He heads for the finish line jump. He's going to take that checkered flag uncontested. Let's see who has the number two position in the last chance qualifier. Would you believe it's John Dowd, the man that dumped it on the track just a moment ago. A timely move for Dowd into second spot. Normally only the winner would move up in the last chance because of the short field here at Seattle. He'll get a shot at the main event coming up in just a moment. For the professionals, qualifying is over. We'll see them again in the main event. You know, there are a lot of other riders here, though, non-professionals, if you will. They've been out here all morning long just tearing up the Seattle King Dome track. Well, they gave the place a workout, Larry, and they deserve a little acknowledgement for it. Let's take a look at the names of the class winners from the amateur event here at Seattle. They're not the names that you'll see in Sunday morning's paper, but they're very, very big names. In the Seattle King Dome. Outside, there's six inches of snow. It's cold and blowing. Inside, we're set for the 125cc main event. It's round four of the Camel Supercross Series. Take a look at the point standings here. You see the contenders lining up at the gate. Ty Davis took over the series lead with his win in San Diego in the last outing. Consistency has kept Buddy Antonez second, Kyle Lewis third. Michael Craig won the opener in Anaheim. Jeff Emig won in Houston, and they are the top five as we get ready for action. You just talked about them. There's Craig on the left, Buddy Antonez was in the middle of that shot of the starting line. To his right, Jeff Emig. The 32nd board has been tipped sideways. Between 5 and 10 seconds, that gate is going to drop. There it goes. The 125 main event is underway in the Seattle Kingdom. Out of the middle of the packet, we've got a couple of riders down already in corner number one. Let's go back and take a look. And it's Kyle Lewis and number 29, Steve Lampson, who got caught back there. Trapped on the inside, no place to go. Good, solid 125 division riders, but out of it for now. They certainly are in the 120. And there we've got another rider down. It looked like Chris Young in the middle of the pack. He, he got the bike upright, and now it looks like he's looking for his motorcycle as the whole herd of 125s flash on by. Young is all right. Uh, he's going to be dumped back in the pack in this one and uh, out of contention for the number one spot. Meanwhile, at the other end of the pack, the leaders flash over the finish line jump. They get the green flag. Showing them the short way around was Jeremy McGrath. He's number 125. Aboard at Kawasaki, you'll see him in just a second as the rest of the field sorts them themselves up and right behind him was rider number whoa, whoa, number 26 <laughs> that was ty davis and we talked earlier about a block pass and i think uh, if the broncos had had that kind of blocking they'd have done well let's go back and take another look at that well this is a block all right larry and it turned out to be a pass davis basically got there too late he wanted to get in front and then make that move and instead he came in and just basically clobbered mcgrath he got the spot but mcgrath will be unhappy about it <laughs> well too late or not he He's holding down that number one position, and uh, I would have to think that at least one of them have a sore ankle along about this time. Ty Davis, number 26, out in front, and opening up about a five-bike length lead. No, McGrath coming back and shortening up that gap. Number 125, we're headed for those corners again where the block passes come into play. Let's see if McGrath will uh, return the favor as they go under the bridge. In defense of uh, number 26, Ty Davis, he had his momentum going into the corner. He was pretty well committed, so he really didn't have the option of not hitting uh, McGrath once he'd committed to the corner. Still his mistake. McGrath seems to have lost his rhythm now, and I don't think he's going to be able to come back and catch him. Well, I'm sure that Jeremy McGrath would argue with that point of view, no matter what your name is, Ty Davis or Dave to Spain, because <laughs> it was a pretty hard hit. Michael Craig, meanwhile, a winner of the opening round in Anaheim, California, has moved up to the number three position in fourth spot. Oh, we've got a battle going on. It was Buddy Antonez aboard that Suzuki, but right now the number four position being taken over by number 59 aboard the Honda. That's Jimmy Button. 
Andanaz got a bad start in this race and then got goofed up on the jump on the very first lap and has had to battle his way back. He seems to be going after that battle for third and fourth with a vengeance as the leader up front is definitely having his way with him. It's Ty Davis with what looks like it could be an easy victory here. It could be an easy victory, but riding a 125 is not easy at all. And there's Buddy Antonez. Buddy back in the number four or five position ran up on top of that big berm, had nowhere to go, and I guess the easiest way to do, uh, or to get out of it rather, was just to bail out and let it fall. Picked it up right back into the fray. Uh, probably lost one, maybe two positions in the process. There's a shot of Ty Davis out front, and looking good at this point. Davis, one year ago, aboard a Suzuki, making the switch in 1990 to the red of Team Honda. As I started to say earlier, when Buddy Antonez uh, interrupted us by taking that little spill, riding a 125 is not all that easy. The bikes have small engines. They have to be revved constantly in and out of the corners, whereas the 250s are more forgiving. You can make a, a mistake, uh, get off the power band, and pick it right back up, and away you go. Here we see the 250 riders at the gate, Larry. They're getting ready for their main event while this guy is running away with his. And this is an important race for Ty Davis. He took over the point lead last week. If he can win this one, he's going to make himself the man to beat in the western region of this 125 class. When you've got a new ride with a new sponsor, it's important to go out and impress him, and he's doing that right now. Indeed he is in this 125 class. That is so important to the other riders because they're so apt at this young age to make mistakes, and that will hurt. There's number 59, Jimmy Button. Button running back now in the number three position. He's been working from out of the pack to uh, uh, start to close slightly on Jeremy McGrath, who's running in the number two slot, and out in front, of course, Ty Davis, the young man that we have been talking to. Button, rider number 59, also aboard a Honda. He's out of Phoenix, Arizona, and is in the top ten in the series standings. Here is McGrath, the man that he's trying to run down. Larry, I think more significant here is the fact that McGrath is actually reeling in Ty Davis, the leader, a little bit. I don't think Button's gaining so much on uh, on the Kawasaki here. Notice the little lift of the front wheel there. He's using the throttle to make the motorcycle easier to ride. Just carry the front end over the whoops instead of having to bounce it over. He's definitely gaining on Ty Davis. So the question is, is number 125, Jeremy McGrath, closing the gap by speeding up, or is Ty Davis, who is out in front and having no one to uh, get himself by as he started to slow slightly and when he comes through the mechanics area we would get some kind of an indication from his mechanic as to where this race is heading my guess is that uh, Ty Davis's mechanic will be leaning out with that signal board pointing back and saying hey McGrath is coming let's twist that throttle and start turning the lap times that you did a little bit earlier here's the standing we'll be right back Welcome back. I'm Larry Myers. With me, Dave Despain. We're in the Seattle Kingdom. Outside the Kingdom, as we have pointed out a couple of times today, six to eight inches of snow is starting to drift out there all day long. Weather reports said stay home, don't go anywhere. But some 38,000 fans have turned up here in the Kingdom for round four of the Camel Supercross Series. We're watching the 125cc main event. This young man, number 26 from Hesperia, California, Ty Davis took the lead early on and has not been threatened. Hasn't been threatened yet, Larry, but I don't think this thing is over. The McGrath kid is definitely trying to close it up. Number 125 on the Kawasaki has been running second now for most of the race. Here you get a glimpse of him, and he's within four, maybe five bike lengths. Davis is solid, but not totally secure. One little mistake, and McGrath is going to be all over him. We've not seen Davis make very many mistakes here, but the option is obviously there. McGrath can keep the pressure on. Again, the pleasures of watching the 125 class. You never know what is going to happen. A short while ago, we watched Buddy Antonez. He was just a little bit over anxious, climb the top of that wall and tip over like that fellow on the tricycle that wore the yellow uh, raincoat from laughing. Uh, you, you just never know in this 125 class. The riders are young to begin with. Uh, they're basically very inexperienced in terms of this type of competition. And there's another shot of McGrath, and he is still charging, holding that position very, very well. Now, they're not inexperienced in racing. Now, most of these kids started back when they were four, five, six years old at the most. So they've had a good number of uh, races, a good number of checkered flags under their belt. However, they've never raced in a stadium in front of 26,000 people. They've never raced to any extent on man-made tracks like they're racing here. Here, the obstacles are designed to uh, pull out the best in a rider, to pull out the best in his motorcycle. You have to hit them exactly right. Uh, they're very unforgiving, or you're going to go down in a heap, or at uh, at least you're going to lose considerable time. 
Hard to believe, Larry, that it was 20 years ago that a bunch of youngsters a lot like this showed up at the L.A. Coliseum and gave birth to this stadium motocross thing. As a matter of fact, I don't think the night that 16-year-old Marty Tripes won the first ever Supercross race that Ty Davis here was uh, even considering a motocross career yet. Here is uh, McGrath running in that second spot, trying to close. Interval seems to be staying the same. Traffic may be the issue now. We can go back, Dave, just to elaborate on that a little bit. I don't think that Mr. and Mrs. Davis were even considering a Ty Davis at that point. Uh, it is hard to believe uh, almost 20 years to the date out at the uh, L.A. Coliseum that Marty Tripes and a whole bunch of veterans, you know, when you stop to think about it, they were all rookies at that point. That was the first ever race, so there were no veterans and rookies then. A lot of things have changed over the years, Larry. Back then, the European riders were the big dogs in motocross, and when they came over to ride the Supercross Series, everybody was amazed. Now we notice that the press book uh, lists the famous uh, Czech rider Yaroslav Falta as Yaroslav Feltz. The Americans have pretty well taken over this series. <laughs> you realize that in this entire stadium, 38,000 strong, you and I probably are the only two people that have ever heard of Yaroslav Falta, let alone Yaroslav Feltz. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Jimmy Button coming up in the number three position, and there's another shot of Ty Davis, our leader, could care less at this point. He's only concentrating on whether or not he can close the gap on Jeremy McGrath in that number two position. And speaking of closing the gap, number 43, Michael Craig, has come from out of the pack to move into the number four spot. Now, Craig is really rather lucky to be here. It was just two weeks ago in Houston, Texas, when Craig was involved in a rather horrendous accident. Let's go back and take a look at Michael Craig jumping on top of Denny Stevenson. Now, here they come around a corner. Stevenson gets a little bit fouled up, and wham! Craig jumps right on top of him. Now, they both got up. It was an amazing sequence of events. Let's take another look at it in slow motion while Craig talks about it. Well, um, I was heading towards the triples behind Denny Stevenson and Jeff Emig. Those two kind of hit. Denny Stevenson, Denny Stevenson didn't quite make the triple jump. And um, while I was in the air, he kind of crossed over in front of me, and I landed on top of him. Landed on top of him indeed, but fortunately, out of that particular race, but into this one and moving up to the number four position. There's the white flag. Zip tie. Ty Davis, number 26, takes it aboard that Honda. He's got to keep it upright, Dave. One more lap. The lap riders are his only real concern now. He's got McGrath pretty much at bay. In fact, Jeremy is not closing up at all. He's going to settle for second spot here. And Davis has just got to worry about threading the needle through those lap riders, getting to the checkered flag. Well, this is going to be McGrath's best finish. So you have to wonder the last couple of laps whether or not Jeremy said to himself, hey, I'm not getting anywhere. I've been letting it all hang out. I think I'm going to collect my second place points. I get to go to the victory rostrum, shake the champagne, and uh, that's a lot better than I've been doing. So I'm going to take what I can get before I hurt it. I'm going to just slow down the pace. Here comes the lap rider problem for Davis as he works his way through. He's getting close to that checker. He's got it all under control and just riding home from here. Is he smiling under that helmet or does he hear things? <laughs> now he's smiling left leg out. That would have to hurt if you ever missed one of those. Oh, we still have a battle on a racetrack. Look at this. Michael Craig, the man we were talking about and watched just a second ago, has passed Jimmy Button. Last couple of corners, Craig is going to take over that number three position. Great save for Craig, who actually fell off early in this race, came back to get the third place points. He's thinking championship. He's riding toward the end of the year, and that third place could be important at the end of this season. The big winner in terms of points is Ty Davis, who wins the race and extends his lead over Michael Craig to 27 points in the regional championship standings. McGrath with third on the track ends up third in the points. Emig and Lewis round out the top five. I really like to watch the 125 class. The riders are young, they're hungry. You never know what they're going to do next, and it's just such exciting racing. It's exciting, Larry, but sometimes it's a little bit tough on the guys, and they pay an awful price for it. Let's take a look.
250cc main event from the Seattle Kingdom. Welcome back. I'm Larry Myers for ESPN. With me, Dave Despain. We've been watching Supercross action, in case you just joined us. We're in the Seattle Kingdom, Seattle, Washington, for round four. The 250s are on the line in just a few moments of the main event, and it's going to be exciting. I think there are a couple of questions that are going to be answered here in the next 20 laps. Is the rookie reign over? Has Jeff Stanton come back and taken control of this series for good? And how bad is Damon Bradshaw really hurt? Well, we'll find out very, very shortly. In the meantime, let's go back and take a look at 1989 action from the Kingdom. This was about as good as it got all last year. Number 16 is Doug Dubach, 20, Johnny O'Mara. Look at the O show. Riding a Suzuki last year, change of brand for 1990, so he's got different number and different costume from a year ago. 11 is Ronnie Tishner, and they just put on a spectacular battle up front. They swapped the lead at every turn of the racetrack. A glimpse of Ronnie Lachine, number four for Kawasaki, who also got into the story. But before this night was all over, these three front runners would find themselves with a chance challenge from the rear. Here's a look at O'Mara, who was leading the race when we got our first glimpse of number one, Ricky Johnson, king of Supercross, on an unbelievable roll, winning the first five races of the 1989 season. He had to run him down from behind as O'Mara ran off the racetrack, trying to keep up with him. And when this one was all over, it was another R.J. benefit in the Seattle Kingdom. Here's the man making the checkered flag turn up and over, and Ricky Johnson showed his stuff. Now we move to tonight. Main event. The 32nd card is up. When it goes sideways, the rider's on the line, and there it is. We'll have between 5 and 10 seconds before the gate drops. There it goes. They're off. Round 4, and a rider is down less than 3 or 4 foot from the starting gate. Now, that's a rough way to start. But Tasevich looked like he pulled. Oh, and we've got a big pileup. David Bradshaw from 15 foot in the air gets off his motorcycle. It looks like he's all right. He's getting up rather slowly, but it looks like he's all right, maybe having the wind knocked out of him. Meanwhile, there's the rider off the starting line getting his bike fired up and ready to go. That's Mike LaRocco, number 10 on the Suzuki. Back to the first corner. Keith McCarty helping Bradshaw off, and there's the other rider that was involved, Kerry Mulligan. Looks like they're all okay. Meanwhile, Rick Johnson, the magic man, had taken the number one position, but he has trouble. Here comes Matasevich. Great move to the outside by Matasevich. He'll take the lead, drop Johnson to second, and Jean-Michel Bale is moving up to challenge Johnson. Oh, we've got a barn burner. We're still in the opening lap in Seattle Kingdom. Let's go back and take a look at that first corner incident that Bradshaw was involved in. Big launch by Damon Bradshaw. Contact in the air. He gets offline, comes right on top of Mulligan. Those guys are lucky they didn't get hurt. I think the question is whether Bradshaw may have re-injured that ankle. Well, let's hope not. It looked like Bradshaw tangled with his teammate, Doug Dubach, in the air. We'll have to uh, get the report on that one a little bit later. Meanwhile, Jeff Matasevich, as he has a couple of times in this series, has taken control. Behind him, Rick Johnson, the magic man. But here comes another rookie, Larry Ward. This is his hometown. He's past Bale. He's up to the number three position, and he is on the gas. Matasevich and Ward have a little tangle in the heat race, you'll remember. Matasevich leading. He's been a front runner all year in this series, but he has not yet developed the consistency that he needs to win races. Speaking of consistency, if you're Rick Johnson, you have to wonder what's going on. Johnson, the king of the sport just one year ago, has had his problems. Meanwhile, Matasevich with no problem. Clear track ahead. He needs to put as much distance now between himself and the rest of the pack as he possibly can. Rick Johnson is busy. He's trying to hold off the charge of Larry Ward and Jean-Michel Bale. So Matasevich could run away at this point glimpse of the fifth place man. Number six is Ronnie Tishner as they freight drain down that set of whoopie dudes. The man they're trying to catch is Matasevich. He's second ranked in the series standings as he clears the start finish jump with the king of the sport Ricky Johnson on his heels and the hometown favorite Larry Ward closing up. Now leading the standings was Jeff Stanton the defending Supercross champ but Stanton is back in the pack. He's not a factor and there Ward makes the pass on Rick Johnson. Larry Ward has taken over the number two position. Ward is going berserk in front of the hometown crowd 38,000 people going crazy, too. This young man is their hero. He has moved to South Carolina. His stepfather working for one of the motocross tracks there in that part of the country. But they very much consider this young man their hometown hero, and he wants to win this race. Comes from nearby Snohomish.
Fish. If you can say that with a mouthful of beans, you've got yourself a talented tongue. Out in front is Potasevic. Larry Ward running second. There goes Jean-Michel Bale. Bale tried to get around uh, Ricky Johnson, his teammate. He was trying to give him plenty of room, and unfortunately, he gave him a little too much room. You can't run outside the Bales. Bale and the Bales, right? Potasevic uses that to open up a little bit of an advantage. He's been a one-two runner all season long, but this looks like it's going to boil down to a two-man battle. Ward now has only Matasevich in front of him. Remember the bad blood from the heat race. This could get real interesting. We go back to the opening round. Anaheim, Matasevich had the lead there after passing Bradshaw, but Bradshaw hung tough. Matasevich appeared to tire. As a matter of fact, when the race was over, he said just that. My arms pumped up. I wasn't able to hold on. Bradshaw made the pass and went on to win. Earlier today in the heat race, something similar happened. Uh, Matasevic had a big lead. Larry Ward reeled him in, and Matasevic later said that he, he tired, but the main event would be different. Let's see what happens as this one unfolds. Meanwhile, Rick Johnson continues to drop off the pace as Ron Tishner has now put the moves on the ex-king of motocross. Since he broke his wrist a year ago, Rick Johnson has never regained the form that made him the king of this sport. He surrendered the spotlight to the likes of this youngster, Jeff Matasevic, being pursued by Larry Ward. Here is Tishner up to third now. That's going to drop Johnson back to fourth spot. Tishner's riding a good race. He's riding extremely well. And though Tishner is not a rookie in the sport, he's really uh, uh, never been one of the more prominent riders. He's coming into his own in 1990. I hate to say it, Dave, but we're back to that same topic of conversation. Rookies and veterans. And right now, the rookies are showing the short way around the track to the veterans. They've definitely had a great season so far. They've been the headline story. We've had about two glimpses of Jeff Stanton, the series champion, all night tonight. We watched Ricky Johnson struggle, and we think back to the days when he won more Supercross races than anybody in history. Broke the record held by Bob Hanna. His wrist still hurts. It works on his head, and Johnson continues to struggle. There's a glimpse of Stanton, and you see he's more than a straightaway behind on bike number one as number 20 Matasevic sets sail out front. Just one year ago, Matasevich was riding in the 125cc class and winning the Western region in that class. As a matter of fact, two years in a row, he was declared the Western 125cc national champion. Now he's doubled the size of his bike, and it looks to me like he's riding twice as good. We'll be back right after this. April 26th through the 29th. Watch the whole Supercross series. We have a real barn burner. Jeff Matasevich, number 20 out of La Habra Heights, California, is ahead of local favorite Larry Ward. He's been there throughout the race. We asked Matasevich earlier if this is any kind of an invocation, he and the rest of the rookies, as to what we can look forward to the rest of the series. You know, every five years or so, it seems like a new generation comes through the sport, and uh, I think it's definitely coming through now. And, uh, I think, you know, Damon's won both of them. Uh, he's going to be tough. Uh, Larry Ward got second. He's going to be tough. There's about three or four or five of us that, that can win the race, the younger guys. As you pointed out one week ago, Dave, the sport of Supercross has been elevated, and the rookies did the elevating. Jeff Matasevich out in front leading Larry Ward. They are putting on a heck of a show for the fans here in Washington. Well, the Washington folks all pulling for Ward, and he is definitely riding the wave of momentum here. He's got Matasevich clearly in his sight. His lines are a little better than Matasevich's right now, and he's closing in on him. This is going to be a side-by-side -side battle within a lap or two. Ironic chicken is what they call Jeff Matasevich, and again, I'll never figure that one out. And they've nicknamed Larry Ward because of his size. He's very tall and gangly. They're calling him Big Bird all over the stadium, as a matter of fact. Our signs proclaiming just that. Jeff Matasevich can feel the thunder from Larry Ward. He looks back occasionally and can see Ward coming. That's not a good sign. Ward has lost a little ground now in that last lap. He got out of shape a couple of times. Doesn't have the traction that Matasevich has. Matasevich's key right now is not to worry about Ward, ride his own race. When he was racing with Bradshaw in the first two events of the series. His mind was possessed by Bradshaw. He was thinking about who was behind him. If he'd been in a stock car, they would have said he was mirror driving. Now he needs to forget Larry Ward, go out and win this race on his own. But one reason Ward is getting out of shape is because Matasevich is in the best lines. Ward is not following. And here we go back to uh, the veterans at this point would watch. They would pick the lines out and look for a pace to pass. But huh, Ward is going all over the racetrack. He's trying to force that move. And he's going to get out of shape because he's riding places that he has not ridden in all night long, looking for that place to pass. And he's also looking to work on Matasevich's head a little bit. Every time he shows him that wheel, Jeff knows he's there. It's a sight game at this point. Now, 
Tasovich went to the inside. Ward scored to the outside. Ward has the drive, and he takes over the number one spot. Larry Ward drove to the inside. I don't think Matasevich was looking for him, but he's in a bad position now. He got Matasevich came to almost the stop. He was trying to block Ward's momentum. Now Ward looks over at Matasevich. He has the inside line. Let's see what he does. He cuts across the yeah. front of it. Look at this. Look at this. Ooh. That's a cheap shot, Larry. We talked about the block pass where you try to get the guy's line away from him. Matasevic just stopped there and tried to hit him. Wow. Ward's not going to like that. They come down through that set of whoop de doo side by side. Now Ward and Matasevic looking at each other. I don't know if they're trying to knock each other off or if they're trying to win races. Look at it. Matasevic off the top of that big jump looks ahead at, at Ward, and Ward is looking backward. They both should be concentrating on the track, but they're worrying about each other. Let's go back and take another look at that incident. As you notice here, when Matasevich comes off the berm and cuts back to the inside, right there, he jumped on the brake, and he did that intentionally to try to hit Larry Ward. Had he kept his momentum up, he would have repassed Ward. Instead, he bumped him and then went on. That was a cheap shot, Larry. Well, in all fairness, Dave, I'd like to go back and take a look at that heat race. Let's set up the pass from the heat race and see what happened there, because Ward was messing with Matasevich back in that heat. Now, here's the heat race. Race. Here they come into that corner, and you'll see Ward put that block pass on him, and, well, it was nothing like what Matasevich did to Ward. I'd have to agree with that. Well, it's a fine line between a, a legal, legitimate block pass, Larry, and uh, the kind of incident that we saw here, but I think, in my opinion, Matasevich stepped across the line. I won't say Ward is completely blameless in this episode. They've certainly, as you said, been worrying more about each other than about winning the race. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Coors Extra Gold Super Challenge, round four of the Camel Supercross Series. I'm Larry Myers. With me, Dave Despain. We're in the Seattle Kingdom. The action has really been hot and heavy. Now, we're looking at a battle here for the number three position. Jean-Michel Bale, number 22. Ron Tishner, number six. The two of them have really been pounding each other and this Seattle Kingdom racetrack. Bale's been working on Tishner lap after lap, trying to set up the pass. Bale out of shape there. Tishner keeps keeping away, uh, taking away his good lines, Larry. Bale sets up up Tishner. Grabs it. Well, again, it's, it's a matter of uh, not following, but moving to the outside and trying to make a pass. Now, there's a shot of the leader, number 17, Larry Ward from nearby Snohomish, Washington. This crowd is going nuts. There goes Bale under the bridge. Back to Tishner, number six. He's in third. Jean-Michel Bale in four, looking for that number three position. The points at this stage of the game are critical. Bale has never won a U.S. Supercross. Neither has Larry Ward, for that matter. Although, interestingly enough, right after signing with Suzuki, Larry Ward went to Bale's hometown, Paris, France and won the big Supercross race there, his first ride for the company. Here is Bale, the Frenchman, trying to put the move on the uh, Florida youngster, Ronnie Tishner, and that battle's been raging for several laps now. The other two riders that are up front, Ronnie Tishner and Jeff Matasevich, they have not won an American Supercross. So one of the four is going to score a victory out here today. And no matter which one of the four does it, the crowd is going to have their money's worth. Bale getting a little bit out of shape coming over the finish line jump, but a perfectly executed block pass. Now, we've looked at that maneuver a couple of times today. There was a good one. Tester comes. Tester! Oh, oh, oh. Now there's a debate right there, Dave. Was it good or bad? Turnabout's fair play. The danger in the block pass is that the other guy is going to be there when you get there, and whoever's got the momentum may come out on top, and Tishner just took the front wheel out from under Bale. Tishner is now third. Bale will fall to fifth. Let's go back and take another look at that incident under the bridge. As they come in, you see Bale setting it up on the outside. When Tishner cuts underneath him, they get to the same spot at the same time, but Tishner's rear wheel is stable. Bale's got a steer with the front, and once Tishner took it out from under, and he was on the ground. The white flag. Larry Ward has one lap to go. Now, the home crowd is standing and cheering. Earlier, we talked to Ward about that crowd and whether or not it would be a help or a hindrance. Um, yeah, that, that definitely helps me. A lot of my friends and family are going to be here watching me, and I, I got a lot to prove. I've been doing real good last couple weekends, and I want to keep, keep going that direction. And that direction is toward the checkered flag. 38,000 people here in the kingdom are all standing and cheering for Larry Ward. What a ride. What a victory this is going to be for the hometown favorite. No stopping him from this point on. He's got Matasevich covered. All he's got to do is avoid that last-minute bobble or mistake, and we are going to see the biggest victory party in the history of the kingdom. Well, just one corner ago, though, we saw him look over his shoulder, wondering, is Matasevich there? Is he still coming? Are we through with the incidents that we had earlier? We're through with them all right. Fist raised in the air. Look at that. The head thrown back. Pump in his arm. This guy is happy. Larry Ward has won the Seattle Kingdom, and we'll be back right after this. 
Round four is history. The riders are still on the track. Jeff Matasevich rode over to where Larry Ward stopped in the mechanics area and offered his hand in congratulations. And I would imagine he said, hey, heat of battle. I'm sorry about that guy. Larry, I'm glad they buried the hatchet because nothing should spoil this moment. Look at Larry Ward and his 38,000 best friends. Dave, I have never experienced such emotion after a race win. Look at Ward. He, you know, the race has been over about three minutes. He is still pumped up and fired up. On the edge of the track, there's Bob Hanna, his Suzuki boss. And boy, you talk about a happy guy. You think Hanna would have won that. And Ward hollered something at him. I don't know what it was. Look at the crowd. Oh, are they pumped. Not a soul has left this stadium. They're standing and cheering Larry Ward. While we have the chance, let's thank the folks here at the Seattle Kingdom, the entire staff, for their help. SRO Pace, the promoters of this event, for helping us put this telecast together. And, of course, the officials from the American Motorcyclist Association. Larry Ward has pulled up to the bleacher area or the grandstand area, threw away some of his uh, riding gear. And I don't know. Yeah, is it the guy, we ought to be playing the stripper right now. Look at this. He's getting up on his seat. No, that's not a good idea. This guy is really pumped, Dave. They may never get him off that motorcycle. He wants to make this moment last a lifetime. Listen to this. I can't say as I blame him. Spotted an old friend up there in the crowd, Larry. 19 years old, and he is on top of the world right now. This kid's going to have a great career, but I don't think there'll ever be another moment to match this one. And he's going to have a great party tonight. <laughs> you know, I wonder if his, if his uh, address is still listed in the Washington area phone book. There's only 38,000 people over at that address tonight, although he lives now in South Carolina. Ward is just, boy, what an emotional moment. Let's look at the results now of round four. Ward winning, of course, Matasovic second. Ronnie Tishner finishing third, Rick Johnson fourth. Rounding out the top five, Guy Cooper aboard the Suzuki. Second five will have Jeff Stanton, Jean-Michel Bale, Kodrowski, LaRocco, and Ward round out the top ten. Let's hear from the happiest man in the Pacific Northwest. I'm the happiest man on this earth right now. <laughs> I just like to thank everybody, man. Everybody stuck around. That really makes me feel good. Thanks a lot. Like to thank, like to thank my mechanic, number one, Jeff Clark. He, if it wasn't for him, I could have never done it. I'd also especially like to thank my mom and my dad and both my stepdad, Harry Thornton, who's helped me out all my life, and my stepmom, Leslie King well, Leslie Ward now. Um, I don't know what to say. Thank you, everyone, so much. I, I also... I only get 50% of the credit. My Suzuki did all the work, not me. <laughs> There's a kid who's learned the uh, lessons of professional racing very early on. Jeff Matasevic has taken over the point lead. Ward climbs to second. Stanton, LaRocco, and Tishner round out the top five. And a new pack of rookies pop the champagne. Where are they coming from? Well, Larry, technically they come out of the 125 class, and that means that there's another whole crop of them coming for next year. But this is really an amazing bunch. I don't think in any form of motorcycle sport we've ever had this many good kids in one crop all come up at once. And they're going to make this championship something to fight for. They definitely are. And the fight will continue in Atlanta, Georgia next week. The Coors Extra Gold Super Challenge. It'll be round five of the Camel Supercross Series. For Dave Despain, I'm Larry Myers. Hopefully you'll join us right here on ES.